Hello, I'm Chloe Cho, and welcome to the season premiere of Investor Insights. Global financial markets are venturing into uncharted territory as questions mount over what defines fair value, as it's tough to price in a future that you don't know. It's a dilemma that investors around the world are grappling with as Brexit takes us into a period of uncertainty. Here's a look at our headlines. As the world reels in the aftermath of Britain's shock vote to exit the EU, global financial markets remain precarious as talk of central bank easing grows. As violent moves in global markets have central banks promising largesse again, will the Federal Reserve be forced to forego its normalizing plans? Plus, how many of our top 20 survived the wild swings emanating from Brexit? Find out in Asia Pacific's first ever televised trading challenge, Trading Talents Asia Pacific. How will Brexit affect your money? Let's get insights from Robert Roundtree, global strategist of eSpring Investments. Kay Van Peterson, global macro strategist of Saxo, who's part of the judging panel on Trading Talents Asia Pacific and Kun Go, head of Asia Research, ANZ. Global financial markets remain unsettled even after $2 trillion was wiped out on Friday, marking the biggest daily loss ever, according to S&P Dow Jones indices, trumping the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy in 2008 and the Black Monday stock market crash in 1987. As political uncertainty continues over if and when Article 50 is triggered to initiate Brexit, debate is growing whether the UK vote represents a market shock or a looming economic crisis. There is plenty of talk of another coordinated central bank response with the Bank of Japan seen making a bold move at the end of July and possibly followed by an RBA easing in August. Traders are pricing out any chance of a Fed rate hike this year while federal funds rate futures suggest even the possibility of a rate cut. As the U.S. dollar rallies on risk aversion, one has to think what this means for U.S. inflation and for emerging markets holding significant U.S. dollar liabilities. As the world grasps with Brexit and its implications, gold, U.S. treasuries, gilts, bunds, the Japanese yen and the Swiss franc are in favor as investors rush for cover. However, sterling continues to face Brexit fallout even after tumbling to a 30-year low. The UK's credit worthiness is taking a hit with Fitch and S&P making cuts while Moody's has its ratings outlook on negative. Much remains to be seen what levels in the pound will trigger the Bank of England to ease a factor at play in boosting demand for gilts as the UK's growth outlook deteriorates. For now, PIMCO expects UK base rates to hit zero by the end of the year. As Brexit fears reverberate around the world, where is our first guest finding value? Let's check in with Robert Roundtree, global strategist of East Spring Investments. Welcome to Investor Insights. The fear and uncertainty grip gripping Brexit and its implication is such that there is a lot of talk of global mm. central banks about to unleash helicopter money. Mm. But we're already in a world where more than $10 trillion of sovereign debt is in negative territory. So what mm. is that going to really mean for investors out there? More concern, I guess. <laughs> you know, be, it, it sounds flippant, but the, the reality is you're right. Um, when you look at the monetary growth globally um, and how that exceeds nominal GDP, there's already sluices of money out there. Mm. And of course, that money is going to find a home. And of course, that money might, will make things more volatile. The situation is such that yields on the entire Japanese bond complex mm. have fallen below 0.1% mm. for the first time. Uh, and there's also talk in Japan about a huge stimulus package, easing, whatever you call mm. it, to the tune of 5% of GDP. Is it going to work? After all, there is so much pessimism and doubt over Abenomics yes. and also the BOJ's negative interest rate policy. You're talking to somebody who's, who's been skeptical of this all along. <laughs> so uh, to me, uh, throwing more money at it, I don't think is going to sort the problem out. Um, I, I differentiate very, very clearly between the companies, which are actually looking in very good shape, and the economy, which isn't. But to come to your point, I think 
what will be necessary and what is absolutely vital with Japan is that you see wage pressures start mm. to rise and money, people start getting money in the pocket. That's the problem. There's no spending power. Why should investors buy into the valuation story now, even though they might be world-class companies, especially as the world becomes more defensive? I don't think you can go wrong by buying, buying value um, because value comes out in the long term. And what we've seen over the last um, couple of months, since last August in actual fact, is that the Asian markets have moved very much in tandem mm. with the world markets, ignoring what's going on in Asia. Now that throws up value. Equities tend to be in difficult, tough situation, especially in a defensive market. They can rally, but these rallies tend to be short-lived or rare. I mean, for instance, just before the height of the European debt crisis, European equities rallied. But then again, that was short-lived and all yes. of the gains were wiped out. Yes. Well, again, it comes back to where those drivers are and it comes back to the liquidity. Mm -hmm. So until you actually see um, solid growth coming through, um, you're going to remain in this period of, of volatility and, and, and switching back between asset classes, which is one reason why uh, U.S. high yields are so attractive. Um, in a low growth environment, U.S. high yields generally do very, very well. How much caution should invest investors exercise when getting into U.S. high yields in light of the fact that even the commodities complex, with an exception of gold mm. and precious metals, oil, all of that stuff is looking pretty vulnerable? Um, it is. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I think, to a large extent, high yields have been inoculated mm. against the uh, oil virus. We've actually seen what would happen. We saw... Um, contagion last year, um, that contagion effect has now worked its way through. So the fact that the high yields actually bounced back, um, I, I think was symptomatic of the fact that people had basically discounted the oil factor and the bad news. China isn't quite seen as the safe haven anymore. Mm. The renminbi has been on a weakening trading band mm. as well. And many investors remember the havoc that ensued in August last year, early this year, whenever the Chinese renminbi weakened, there was so much uh, investor yes, yes. panic. To me, with China, I'd be looking very much at the return on capital employed, mm. which is still falling. Now, when you've got a liquidity-driven market, that's the last thing people are looking at, mm. which they should be, because once that starts to turn, then a lot of these fears surrounding China, which are liquidity-induced, um, will actually disappear very, very quickly. Mm. Okay, well, we'll leave it there for now. <laughs> Robert Roundtree <laughs> taking us through his thoughts on what is value out there in this defensive environment. And coming up next, we are going to find out how many got eliminated in the first week of the finals of TTAP Trading Challenge Asia Pacific, the first televised trading challenge right here in Asia. We're going to check in with Kay Van Peterson of Saxo Bank Group. Hello and welcome back. It is time for Trading Talents Asia Pacific, the first ever televised trading challenge here in the region. Here's a look at a top 20 and the rules of the game. Get ready for Trading Talents Asia Pacific. More than 2,000 trading enthusiasts applied, but only 20 emerged as finalists after four qualifying rounds in Asia Pacific's first televised trading challenge. Congratulations Thank for you. making it to the top 20. I was working for a bank earlier on in a treasury, and uh, now we are working here uh, in a hedge fund. I've always been into trading. I'm currently working in a Chinese bank. So dealing in the lending fee business. Uh. I manage the ASEAN and the Greater China portfolio. Did you know that you're our youngest competitor to make it through to the final round? I do now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm turning 21 this year. Yeah. What do you think gives you an edge in this competition? I was a so-called market maker, currency trading, so I mainly trade Forex. Why you work for uh, Paul Tudor Jones at Tudor Capital? His motto on his desk, uh, is this a hard trade? So is this a hard trade? It was hard to understand in the beginning. Did you think hard enough for the trade? Did you wait hard enough for the levels to get in? But the thrill of being in the finals was short-lived as the top 20 began their first week facing a volatile market gyrating on Brexit headlines. I think they already made <laughs> it. will be a Brexit and sterling could go down to 130. It seems like the sterling, uh, the option is is fantastic. Right after the, e the events, we'll, well, there will be plenty of opportunities. Probably we get a rally in uh, sentiments in general. 
Much remains to be seen how many of her top 20 executed what they had set for prior to the epic vote. Being on the wrong side of a trade could have easily wiped out the 10,000 US dollar balance in their live accounts with access to thousands of instruments from Forex, options, CFDs to futures. Five finalists are eliminated this week based on the judging criteria of net portfolio value, max drawdown, judges' scores, and clout score that gauges their social media influence. Up for grabs, the grand prize of 30,000 US dollars, another $10,000 for the runner-up, and $2,000 for the top weekly trader. Plus, five online voters voting for their favorite trading talent get to win $100 worth of e-vouchers each week. Hands down, this is the toughest market they've ever traded. The correlations don't make sense. The dislocations don't work. Got to expect the unexpected. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a strange market we're in at the moment. Unless you think that you have some sort of edge, uh, whether it be uh, informational or, or an edge about uh, how you think about the way assets will price, uh, then it's very difficult to, to outperform the market consistently. Trading alpha is about seeing what other people don't see, finding opportunities that have been overlooked. All right, one down and five more to go. Our top 20 may have beaten the tough competition with 2,000 others. However, how did they fare in the first finals week? Let's find out more with Kay Van Peterson, global macro strategist of Saxo Bank Group. He's also one of our judges. So, Kay, great to see you. Great to be here. What a tough week. We had huge volatility, huge swings. I sure. mean, uh, up to a point of about 1,700 pips on Sterling at one point. It was really, really tough. I know if we just focus on the last week, which was obviously the period of the competition. Mm. Um, and if you had basically a bias for the remain, so kind of a risk on trade uh, as, a, as a kind of a strategy, you would have done pretty well mm. up until Thursday. Right. And actually quite a few of the people that lost had done relatively well up until Thursday night. Mm. And of course, uh, the positioning you could see from the moves on Friday was no one was really expecting it out there in the market. Right. right. How, I mean, how could the bookies be so wrong? So let's first talk about the top three. Sure. Uh, we're not going to reveal who they are, but the top three. So uh, one of them is Rahul. He had expected Brexit and his call for Sterling was right down to 130. Yeah, no, he had, and uh, he had a very good write-up, very good kind of trading plan for the week. He was also very, very good at, I think, illustrating how key of an event this is. I'm not mm -hmm. quite sure a lot of the other contestants, they knew about it, obviously, but I don't think they quite realized the magnitude. You know, from a global macro perspective, it does not get any bigger right, than the right. Brexit event, right? And he kind of stuck with his plan, which is pretty much to do nothing and to actually trade the event on Friday. And you could see that from the PNL, right? Mm -hmm. It was pretty much flat. You know, and then last day, exploded to the upside. He did very well. So for some of the contestants who were expecting remain, for instance, Tracy uh, was one who expected remain, but she came out pretty well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I like, you know, Tracy. Um, she it was a redemption story, which is a perpetual theme as a trader or as an investor, <laughs> right? As these periods of drawdowns and you kind of redeem yourself. And, you know, she was down from, you know, 5% uh, and actually came back and, uh, you know, was down on Thursday, but actually popped right back up. Uh, on, on Friday, so did very well to position for uh, for an exit. So, actually. what is the strategy when you when you end up being on the wrong side of a trade? Listen, it's it's art and science, right? Um, I think a lot of people, we're talking about professional investors as well, were expecting the remain, mm. right, and positioned for it and lost a lot of money. And I think the more important thing around these events is to actually see how is the market positioned? Mm. You know, how much is priced in? And we were advocating even on Thursday to the clients I was speaking to that a lot of it is priced in for risk. Right. Uh, on, and if anything, you want to potentially be contrarian, right? Uh, so you have to be very nimble because if you're not watching the screens as the voting was coming through, and let's say you woke up in the U.S. session, you mm. know, that sterling fall already happened in essence, right? Right. So how important is it to have product diversity in such a big event like this or go all in? Asset class diversification helps. It really does help in, in mitigating volatility. 
products, sometimes people make the mistake of having the same type of exposure, just having mm. it in different kind of products. So you have to be a little bit kind of careful there, and we actually saw that, right? Uh, and, and, you know, and we had, uh, for instance, uh, you know, one of the, the losers had a full, full drawdown. Mm. Uh, you know, she was positioned long sterling and long European banks, right? Mm. And she would have done well if she got the remain, uh, you know, vote, but it was the complete opposite, and those were probably the two worst exposures to have on a surprise uh, voting like we did. So, I mean, we just talked about the losers. So aside from bad positioning, but is there a way to recover from that? Is there some lesson that investors can learn? On some positions, literally no. Because mm. uh, as you rightly pointed out, if you were long cable and it gapped down from 150 straight down to 140 and then eventually even lower, there's very little you can do. Generally speaking, in a more fluid kind of market, which I think we'll hopefully get more this week, oh. uh, it'll be interesting <laughs> to see how people do this week, right? Uh, with that one big key event, uh, you know, you tend to kind of already maybe have some stops uh, that kind of protect you if you're getting something wrong. Let's find out who is the winner of the week and plus our top 15. The winner is. Okay, thanks so much for that. There you go. We'll check in with you again very shortly. And remember, folks, next week is all about non-farm payroll. So another tough trading week awaits our top 15. And don't forget to log on to tradingtalents.saxo to vote for your favorite trading talent. And up next, as FX markets brace for more Brexit mayhem, let's check in with ANZ's head of research for some analysis up next. Welcome back. Currency markets have been at the epicenter of Brexit mayhem. And let's get some currency strategy with Kun Go, head of Asia Research at ANZ. What a week. And we'll take it really one day at a time, right? So let's start with sterling. We've seen manic volatility. I talked about 1,700 pips and even beyond that within a matter of hours on Friday. We seem to have found some sort of stability, but it looks like a lot of hedge funds are placing bets at around initially I heard 120. The next stop I hear is 110. What is your view? I think sterling will certainly come under further downside pressure over the coming weeks and months because the uncertainty that they find themselves in is really unprecedented. Mm. Uh, and we don't really know how things are going to play out. So while technically nothing has changed, the UK is still part of the EU for now, uh, but we don't really know how the, the divorce is going to go. We don't even know when they're going to file the papers. And we don't even know who uh, the new prime minister is. Uh, and we don't even know who the new opposition uh, labor um, uh, leader is going to be. So what's your near term target? Uh, so I think we're going to see Sterling heading down towards a new trading range. I think the 130 level, which is a key level, will probably break in the coming weeks. Mm. Uh, as the uncertainty starts to weigh. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if we start to, to see uh, it heading to us around that 125 level uh, over the coming weeks and months. For now, a lot of talk is reverberating about easing. But if we take a look back to the experience in 1992 when George Soros became the superstar of having broken the back of mm. the BOE, um, one could argue that maybe at some level it could trigger the Bank of England to hike rates back in 92. They did it to as high as 12 percent, 15 percent, although it was a very brief period. I don't think the Bank of England will look to defend uh, the decline in the sterling by hiking interest rates because, quite frankly, I think they'll do more damage to the UK economy mm. than necessarily assist it. I think the sterling is doing exactly what it's supposed to do, which is a shock absorber. Uh, the UK has experienced a huge shock uh, and the currency market has adjusted accordingly. Uh, and to put it quite frankly, the UK is running quite a large current account deficit at right. about 5.2% of GDP. Now, when it was part of the EU, markets didn't really put too much focus on that. Uh, but now that uh, it is looking to be outside of the EU, suddenly funding that deficit becomes a little bit more problematic, particularly with the UK losing its AAA rating status. Are there some uh, better pairs to trade? What about the Sing dollar? Sing dollar should continue to uh, outperform 
uh, sterling. So sterling sing currently we're about 180. I, I see it potentially a move towards uh, 175. Uh, and uh, also against um, other uh, currencies such as uh, the Aussie dollar, for example. I mean, Australia still has AAA rating, higher yields than sterling. Uh, and I can see a lot of uh, FX reserve managers wanting to switch their allocation out of sterling into you know, other good quality assets. Yeah, AAA club getting smaller and smaller <laughs> in this environment. RBA meets next week. Uh, is it expected to do something or is it going to wait at least until August? Uh, I think they'll probably wait and see how things uh, play out. August is probably the most uh, likely uh, timing if they were to decide to move. Uh, the Australian currency is sort of stuck in, in the middle at this point in time. It still has some uh, you know, very attractive properties, uh, but yet at the same time, uh, in a risk of global environment and downside growth risk, uh, typically the Aussie doesn't perform too well there. What about the dollar yen? There's so much talk, anticipation about this bold move from mm. the Bank of Japan. How would you trade dollar yen at this point in time? I would actually, uh, to be honest with you, steer clear away from that because mm. while you can argue, uh, given a risk of environment, safe haven flow should push dollar yen below 100, uh, the threat of intervention is there and mm. growing uh, the lower dollar yen gets. Uh, and also, uh, I think the Bank of Japan, there's a strong likelihood they will come up and ease policy further at their July meeting uh, in order to try and uh, offset the downside risk, uh, bring inflation up and more importantly, trying to get uh, the yen weaker. The Chinese renminbi, the mm. trading band has been weakening. Mm. Uh, do you have, a be is there a good way uh, for traders to take advantage of some of the opportunities? It's quite interesting that the Chinese dollar Authorities are a lot more comfortable in allowing the renminbi to weaken. In fact, uh, on a trade-weighted uh, index basis, uh, the renminbi has been weakening since late last year. They're down about almost 6% uh, so far this year. Uh, and that's actually going to create uh, more headwinds for other Asian currencies. A better way to play it is actually uh, to, to short other uh, currencies that are uh, competing against China in third markets, such as uh, the Korean won or the Taiwan dollar. Mm, okay, great stuff there. Kungo of ANZ. Before we go, here's our question of the week. As we gear up for another round of non-farm payrolls in the U.S., what are the chances that the Fed will cut rates at the end of July if jobs disappoint? Tweet me at Chloe Cho TV or email us at InvestorInsights at MediaCorp.com.sg. And that's it for a season premiere of Investor Insights featuring trading talents Asia Pacific. Be sure to tune in next week to find out all the goings on in global financial markets. I'm Chloe Cho, and on behalf of the entire team, many thanks for your company.